I got him good. Sweet. You good? All right. Thanks everybody for coming today. Um, got some awesome fishermen here. They're going to give us some great seminars, some great information on what's going on with the rivers and lakes. Um, got John Spatterford is one of our bro staff. Jennifer Wilson and uh, Lyle Stokes with Catfish Weekly. Well, John, go ahead and give you his uh, his information that he's got to help share. Spiel. Little spiel. Like we said, I'm John Spadafore. I'm from Central Missouri. I mainly fish the Missouri River. Uh, some of the lakes, like the Ozarks, Mark Twain Lake a little bit. But I get pretty tongue-tied sometimes when I'm talking. So I decided to make a little, short little video, maybe seven and a half minutes. And once the video gets done, then the, so you all answer questions, and I'll try to answer them the best I can and not go off the guy. <laughs> I want to do a short video and explain how I walk ways. Everybody does it a little bit differently, but in the end, we're all trying to do the same thing. We're out here in the current, we're trying to just let our bait slip backwards along the bottom of the river. And we come across a little ditch in the bottom of the river. Something like that. We're a big rock. The fish is going to be behind. And as our bait goes by here, they come up, he's going to grab it, and we're going to have a lot of fun. Uh, about a four ounce weight. If the current was a little bit right there for five ounces, it would have been a little three months. But generally, that's going to handle most situations. Again, it's like six mile hour current, I'll switch to a six, or two, take out with those maybe. Uh, you just get jack and bait, get a circle hook. Uh, how the circle hooks don't get on that point as much, you're going to get really good time on those walk baits, especially while you're learning. Once you once you learn what to feel for, you go get a brush pile and down the field a little bit. Uh, when you're starting out, you're just going to feel it's real tight. You're not going to break it off. Or, it's going to be good times. So, what we got for the, the kind of conditions we're fishing right here, we're right on the currency. It's really hard to see with the naked eye you come back through here. You're not going to see the currency right here. But, just by doing this a lot, kind of paying attention to what's going on on both sides of the boat, you know, compared to where I'm at. Water on this side is just a little bit fast on the side of the boat.
run chain swivels. On the Missouri River, the top four or five foot of that water column is about a four mile hour current to a five mile hour current. But once you get down below, there's so much brush and stuff on the bottom of the Missouri River that that water slows down a whole lot. And so the baits don't tend to twist as bad. I in, uh, Mississippi, in Memphis on the Mississippi last year, uh, we had a lot of problems with our baits twisting up. So we had to add a swivel between on that leader. And then I would go from a two foot uh, main line of baiting down to my swivel. And then I would go uh, another foot, uh, main line after swivel to my foot. You run a load on there? Uh, I'm trying floats out right now, right so far so good. Or I've never seen anybody use a float, but it's working pretty good for me so far. Uh, I'm finding I'm getting tangled up less. If you keep your line tight, the problem when your weight hits the bottom, if you give it any slack at all, that lets your bait kind of fall down and get the copper rocks or sticks or whatever. So, so far so good with the float, but I can't say for 100% sure I like it yet. You talk about that ledge. What's what's that ledge? So there's all kinds of ledges in a, in a river. You got your channel. There's going to be a ledge on each side of the channel, uh, naturally, because that's where the biggest flow of water is. So you know, just it, it doesn't have to be a four foot rise from the ledge. It can be a, as small as a six inch rise or one one foot rise, and that's going to that's going to draw those fish to follow. They're just going to follow any kind of contour at all. But typically, where I fish on the Missouri River, there's there's a couple of ledges. When you come down from those rock banks, you'll come down to drop off into a ledge, say at 15 foot, and it kind of drops off shelf, another shelf to 20 foot. And if you go on the other side of the river, on the mud flat side, there'll be another ledge over there, or a couple of ledges. You, just, you gotta find what ledge those fish are gonna be on that particular day. And that all has to do with the, the water, what the water's doing, if it's rising, uh, the water, the, trash and stuff tends to go to the outside of the river. So when the water rising, you do better on bank holes and stuff like that because you're right up against that bank. It's where for me, walking baits out towards the middle of the river, I typically do better if the water's falling a little bit because it kind of draws that stuff into the center. Live bait or cut bait? For Mainly cut bait. If, uh, pretty much always cut bait. If I'm going after heads, I'll use, uh, I'll use live bait, but typically I'm always hanging that is a little target for us. Well, that style of fishing, you can't use live bait. Yeah. Yeah, you could. Yeah. What size of bait are you using? I'll use a, my favorite go-to bait. It depends on the day. Some days they want a big piece of bait, a little piece of bait. A skipjack head cut off behind the gills about the size of your hand. It's kind of my, that's my ideal go-to bait. Where do you find skipjack? I buy it in, uh, I'm from Central Missouri, so I buy it there in Columbia from Tucson Tackle. And they buy it from down mm -hmm. south where uh, guys are paid to catch bait. They, they got a lot. <laughs> you do anything different versus the shelf out the main compared to what you would have done on a say, small run bridge violating or anything? Or What's that? Legend about the main channel or the you know, like big scar all run bridge violating? You do anything different with your technique? No, not necessarily. It depends on the current. You know, if there's enough current, even though. <clears throat> Say your bridge pilings or whatever, I would still try to walk banks by that bridge piling and I may pull the control the motor up and go back above it and walk down the other side of it. If there's a current, if there's not enough current, you'd have to anchor, of course. And, uh, Put yourself down. About half the current uh, is general rule of thumb. I like to be around one mile an hour. So if it's a two mile hour current, then I'm doing it in perfect world, one mile an hour. But even like a three or a four mile hour current, I still like to be less than two mile an hour. Two mile an hour gets pretty fast, and really one mile an hour doesn't seem like it's very fast at all. But you're actually doing it, and you're getting hung up several times. It's, everything happens pretty quick. You turn around in that video a lot. But, uh, I'm watching that troll motor hit because my troll motor will it'll self adjust. It has a function that's got an end button, I guess it means one mile. I get that, it'll self adjust, but every once in a while, it, it doesn't know exactly where I want to go, so it'll get off it. And if you're not right on that scene, you're five, five foot off, you might be 50 foot off. You got to be stay right on that scene. What, uh, what reel are you using? A guy, I can't really tell you the. Name, but I just got it last year. I really haven't used it a whole lot. 
I'm using the actual bump and uh, on all my acre routes, I just have a receiver. Line counter on there? Yes, it does have a line counter. It's not something you would have to have, but it, it makes it nice sometimes, especially when you got a buddy with you and you're walking back and you kind of think about it because you get hung up together and now the hooks comes back and forth. So you get your hooks hung up together with any more fishing in one little spot and you don't want that to happen. So if you ever think that happened, you can look over and say, hey, how far out are you? If you're 100 foot, he's 200 foot, you know you're not hung up together. I think you probably have something else going on, some line twist, <coughs> something like that. Does everybody know what I mean by the curve It's kind of where uh, the current scene, you can get a current scene many different ways. But on the river, current seat. So on one side of the boat, the water, like if you threw a, a jug out on one side of the boat or cork or whatever, the one on, on one side of the boat is going to go faster than the other side of the boat. And what it means is just everything just kind of gets funneled right there. And it can kind of, it can get funneled further into that current seat, but it really can't go further out. In that current, and that current seat, depending on what, the flow of the water, will move in and out from that bank. Not so much in a day's time, but as the water goes up and comes back down. So if the water's up the flood stage, it's going to be way <coughs> there. If you watch your map, your, your track that you ran last time when the water was low, if the water's really high, it may be 10 foot closer to the bank. But the, the bank's also going to be 10 foot further in also. So is that what you look for then? It, say you don't have any technology to go by. Yeah. You look at a curtain, you look at... Even if you had the technology, you still you still have to read the water. That, that depth finder will only do so much for you. I get myself in trouble a lot trying to look at the depth finder too much because I'm just not smart as smart as the depth finder is. But if I kind of go back to my roots sometimes and look at that water, I, I tend to do a lot better, especially whenever I can mix the technology. Have you usually seen that on the on the on the rock side? Do what? That currency is that more? You see that? You have a currency on both sides. Okay. And you really you'll have two to three different different kind of currencies, and you really they're so minute you have to. Kind of be in them and pay attention to what's going on with the scene. But over on that mud flat side, uh, there'll be kind of, we've got a lot of wing dikes and trail dikes on the Missouri River. And where every one of those dikes are, there's going to be a current seat because you've got behind the dike and you've got fast water around the side. So every one of those is going to have a current seat. You just kind of add everything you know together. You've got current seats, you've got holes, and you can find some bait somewhere. And you've got three things to work off of. And there's probably going to be fish around there. But they pretty much all the fishing I do is always revolve around some kind of currency. If it's in flood stage, what are you looking for? <laughs> do anything different to your fish for two bodies meat like that at home? We got Stuck River down to the Mississippi River. Sure. Obviously, there's a big, big difference in currents. Uh, right there around Jeff City, where I fish a lot, we've got the Osage River, which uh, Lake of the Ozarks tailwaters that come out there. And I fish around that a lot. And uh, we'll get a really defined current seam right there because that water coming out of the lake of the Ozarks is a really clear water. In Missouri, it's about as dirty as chocolate milk from time to time. So I'll fish right there on that current seam a lot. And you know, I find on that, because that's way out, way off the bank, kind of the middle of the river, you really need electronics for that because you don't have any visual reference to go off of to know, well, I caught that last fish and I was about, even with that tree 50 yards off the bank, what if that doesn't work out there because you're even with that tree, maybe a hundred yards up or downstream. But yeah. if, if it's always, it's always within 20 foot of that currency where I catch the fish at. Fish are seen like that where you got two bucks, two bucks, two rivers coming together. Sure. Or whatever. I look for anything. I know, you, you know it's a big difference as far as uh, temperature differences. Cause a ton of like I've seen places where you got the water coming in, say five degrees cooler than the water going into the Sure. Uh, in the, especially in the wintertime. In the wintertime, uh, the water in Missouri, Missouri flows hard all year long. It never really slows down. And it'll be, uh, you know, in the heart of the dead winter, February, January, it'll get down to 35 degrees or so. Once it gets lower than that, I just quit fishing because the fish get real sluggish. But it'll be 35 in Missouri, but you go up in the Osage right there at the mouth, and it'll be 40, 42 degrees. And those fish will they'll move up into that uh, warmer water because that's where they fish are going. I've had a lot of success like that the time. And not so much just in the Osage, in small creeks and tributaries, <coughs> a little bit shallower water, the slower water. So when you're balancing out, how much line do you like to have out? In your video, you were kind of reeling in at times. I know you probably. Yeah, it's, a, it's a constant struggle. You either let the line out, take the line in, or, or you're coming up because you're not paying attention. Uh, I try to stay, I like to be over 100 foot and less than 200 foot. Sometimes I'll go out to 250, 300 foot just to. 
mess around and, and see see if I can still. Because I'm guessing further out, the, the little is cold, and you're barely coming off the bottom there. So is that yeah, kind of you like? Yeah, because you feel that the bottom. further out you get, the more angle you got on your line. So yeah. when you pull it back, pull it up. I guess you're not so much pulling it up; you're just pulling it back. Yeah. So you might pull it back six foot, but you might not move it that far off the bottom. Yeah. And you can you can walk baits a long ways back, mm-hmm. but you're better off to just put more weight on or. Or let, you can let the boat go a little bit faster too. Uh, if you're running a mile and a half per hour, you can let it go two mile an hour. As that, you're not going to have as much resistance then because your boat's going with the current more fluidly. So you're fishing with the current? Yes, I got the nose of the boat, which you couldn't really see. I wish we'd got that yeah. camera angle just a little higher, we could see the water better. But the current's going that way, so I'm facing the nose of my boat is pointing upstream. And I've got that trolling motor that's just kind of cutting it down. You can drag a chain too if you don't have a trolling motor or if you don't have a big trolling motor because it takes a big trolling motor. To, to but you're down. fishing off the back of the boat then? Yep. So, so your bait's actually going? Going going down the current, yes. Going down with the current. The theory is you're, you know, if, if there's a dead fish in the, in the, in the river, oh. it's just floating down the river, it's, it's floating down to two mile there, it's going to be pretty hard to catch. So my bait's going at half that speed. It's easier, easy for that fish to catch. So as I come up on, because you know catfish got great smelling senses, mm-hmm. they can smell it from way out there. I don't know how far, a long ways. They can smell that coming, so they can just sit there and get ready for it, and just lay there until my bait's there, and then they're they, they're already honed in on it. Very rarely do you ever miss a fish while the baits. If you do, it's because you didn't feel you weren't paying attention. I just wondered how it worked. Like didn't wonder we're up here with. Work very well. How deep a water do you all have up here? Huh? How, how deep a water is it? Uh, right now? Eight to ten feet, usually. Sometimes, yeah. sometimes less. Sometimes there's a couple holes, you know, to where you can find more than 20 foot of water. But in, curve, in high water, it would probably work pretty good. Uh, when you get in shallow water, you need so much current just to get your bank back. You yeah. almost be jigging straight up and down, which that could work too. I've, I've caught fish like that. So I just wanted to do we don't have anything like that, you know, but for that speed. Yeah. Most, most around here, you can run a 36 pound trolling motor and you can go upstream. Right. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you all have a little bit slower water than we have. In the deep. I've been working out some months ago. I I, I, would, I wouldn't even try to get out there in my little boat, <laughs> especially with, especially during the winter when the ice is blowing by. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when that ice truck's coming by, I, I try to go find something else to do. Go trap for a couple of days or, or something to stay in the house. They're trying to do that now and then, too. What, uh, what many test line are you using? I run an 80 pound uh, braided line and then a 50 to 80 pound mono lead. Just depends on what kind of mood I'm in. Uh, the 50 breaks a lot easier. That, that 80 pound gets pretty tough on hand from time to time. Another little thing I do that uh, you all may or may not know, whenever I get hung up, when you're walking base, you know, everything, when you get hung up, everything happens real fast. If you're going downstream, there's nothing you can do to make your boat go upstream besides start the big motor and pull up. So you need to break off really fast. So I'll tell you, you can wrap the line around the reel, get the, the reel, the spool the reel like that. Wrap it around the reel a couple times, so that way I don't have to, because your drag will only hold 22 pounds, 24 pounds. That way you've got a direct connection. You can break the line off real quick. But it's a lot easier just to lose that dollar hooker or whatever and spend five minutes of time than it is to wrap your hand off or whatever. It's kind of, it can be a scary situation if, you don't, if you're not ready for it. How much rod movement when you're bouncing? Like, are you How far? Like, yeah. It really is. Used to it, you don't move it. Just, when you're first first learning, you want to move it a lot further. If you want to pick it up off the bottom, make bigger bigger jumps. But the, the smallest you can get away with it would really be the best because every time you pick it up, you could be picking up over the top of the fish. So the closer you keep to the bottom without getting hung up, this would be the correct answer. If you hit it too low, you're going to come up the bottom. It's kind of it's a lot of trial and error. Spend countless hours out there trying different things. Say a lot of bad words. Is braid a necessity when you're walking base? Braid is is basically a necessity for walking base because mono has stretch in it, uh, so you're not going to feel bottom gear as good with mono. And the 
grades are just way more sensitive. So yeah, grade it for for your leader. You don't have to have grade if you're main line. You have grade. I even thought about using for my uh, for my weight instead of using fifty pound mono leader, getting like a twenty pound uh, braided leader to see if for my weight. So see if maybe I get a little more feel like that. Little things like that keep my OCD in mind. <laughs> What's your distance? What's Stretch river that you're always doing, or if you're on a new stretch river, how what's your distance? On a new stretch river, I'll just find those rock revetments. Uh, you can kind of look at the map, and they always is where the, the channel kind of comes up close to the bank. And I'll just start off fishing somewhere to try to figure out a pattern if they're at the, I call it rock walls, if they're at the top of the rock wall, or the middle of the rock wall, or the bottom of the rock wall, or, or the dikes. Just kind of break it up into four sections or five sections. Whatever works for you, or if they're in the mouths of tributaries, or whatever. Try to figure out some kind of pattern and work off of that until I figure out exactly what they what, where they're at. So you won't find a segment and like kind of just say it's a four mile or half mile, and then you run that and go back down and run it again just in case. Oh sure, yeah, okay. yeah. But just to figure, well, I'm starting out to figure out where they're at. You know, I'm gonna fish five miles of rivers a day. If I've got a tournament in a couple of days, you know, theoretically you have three days of pre Day one, you just figure out what the fish are doing, where what I, what do I need to fish around. Day two, you've got to hold it in a little bit. Day three, you figure out exactly where you want to fish. You may have one spot 15 miles upstream and one spot 20 miles downstream. You, know, you may have it narrowed down to a 100-yard stretch, but you had to fish that whole 50-mile section to find those. Do you use your depth finder to find the catfish? Yeah. Not near as much on rivers as I do lakes. On lakes, I won't fish a spot unless I see fish on depth finder. In rivers, I look more for uh, brush piles or stuff like that. What depth finder do you have? I have an Unbird of the 98. It's kind of, it's not an old it's, it's not a new unit. Either. It's not a new unit. Right. Uh, it's not the scan, side scan or anything like that? It, it, has, it has side scan, yes. Oh. Yeah. It's a 10 and a half inch screen, I think. It's, it's pretty nice, but it's not the, the super, super nice one. It's not one. Those old timers were catching fish back before I was born, and all they had was, was a fishing pole. They didn't have any. I try not to get too wrapped up in technology. You can sink a lot of money into that. Hey, Ken. <laughs> How long has bumping been going on, basically? I mean, is I just started doing it the year before last. I've been playing around with it for a couple of years, but really just started doing it last year. Was there like a couple old boys down there or something that said, hey, give this a whirl or something like that? Or how did that all come about? We've got, there's a group of guys there around Columbia, Missouri that, that do a lot of tournament fishing and I've kind of fell into running with them a little bit. And a couple of lips, they talk about bumping a little bit. Of course, nobody wants to tell you exactly what they're doing. Right. But I had the general idea, and then I'm just paid up the efforts and I have to go every weekend or I feel like I'm good guys. Spent a lot of time out there, so I decided to start doing it. And once I started doing it, I started catching a lot more fish than I was on anchor. Not so much every day, I catch a lot more fish, but I'm always doing something. I don't feel like I'm ever wasting any time when I'm on the days. But it's, it is not for everybody. It's tough to learn how to do tackle and get mad, get in some bad situations. But what do you look for in a rod? For? What's that? What do you, what do you look for in a rod? Or in a rod? Uh, I started out with a St. Croix rod, and it was pretty. It was a pretty nice rod. Uh, I think it was like a hundred bucks. It was a really heavy action, almost like a pool cue. Uh, you don't want it hardly any bend in that rod. If, if it has much bend, every every little bit that that rod bends, you're taking away from some of the sensitivity. And it, they may have some lighter action rods. I need a real heavy rod for rod fish, anyways, in that heavy current. But uh, the mud clubs actually have a new rod that's coming out. I'm using it right now. I like I like it a lot so far. It's a blast rod, so it's it's not gonna break. Most of the buffing rods are a uh, carbon fiber rod, and a lot of times, you know, it, by the time you bounce around the boat a few times and show it your tailgate, whatever, you get a little mix in, and eventually they'll they'll wear out. Where a blast rod should last a lot longer, but still kind of in the trial stage with that. Just anything sensitive and heavy action. I think that, you know, just thinking about 
our situation local and stuff like that, we don't really, you know, we weren't, we don't know anything about that here. You know, we've got smaller rivers, you know, we're fishing channels and flatheads, basically we don't have the blues in the interior rivers here. But to know that we can drive two hours west or east of here and get into that and learn these tips and techniques from you guys that know this stuff, you know, I think that's awesome, you know, to, to be able to just jump in the truck and, and, and go west or east to, to, to do something new and, <coughs> and uh, you know, to go after these, these big trophy blue cats. That's awesome, man. And you don't have to walk baits to catch to catch big cat. Really, if your goal is just to catch one huge cat, one, one huge blue, you might be better off to not walk baits. You might be better off to just find one certain brush pile on one of those rocker pivots and anchor off ahead of it and give him an hour of bite. Because he may not be hungry where your, your bait comes through if you walk baits. But your, your idea with that is you're covering ground. And yeah, I'm going to show it to a thousand 50 pound fish where you're going to try to force it down one 50 pound fish's throat. Right. It's just two different ways. I get out fished all the time by your fishing. Yeah. It's, just, it's just my way. You take my way, River's way, and Lyle's way, put them all together, then you start start to put something together, start to put a plan together. You have a pretty clean run of river. To Nasty or better for me. Uh, as far as bottom structure, rock, it, you know, rock forms and all that stuff, you can bump over those. Yeah. Yeah. Won't get, I mean, I'm sure you'll get oh, a yeah, great tackle and start cussing, but... Me and Boomer fished the tournament last year out of Jeff City. How many times did we get hung up in that tournament, Boomer? I'm sure we lost $100 with the tackle. I guarantee it. I bet we... Yeah. <laughs> and it's our, both of our home stretch. It just... Sure, sure something was going on. I mean, it was just... There was a lot of tackle. Yeah. But we... I mean, we got third in it, so, you know... Yeah. You, you've got to be in the shit to be with the fish. If you yeah. all find Danny, so with your gift card, right? What? <laughs> what? Oh, oh, oh. How long did you say you were your, 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 the leader? Uh, about three foot or so. You can go longer, you can experiment a little uh, A little shorter, <laughs> tends to twist a little, a little bit less, a little longer. I don't know. I like it longer. I'm not sure why. You said just out of float. Where do you put that? The float, when I run a float, I'm running that float about four to six inches from the boat. Now, I'm trying with some different floats right now. The one I'm using right now is a four inch uh, kind of scoop, like past you style of float. It's got a rattle in it. Same one for you, Thumb LOZ? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yep. What's the Not the exact same. Pretty much. Yeah. What's the benefit of the float? It just keeps it floats your bait up. Uh, so you have to do less bumping? No, you got to do just as much bumping, but it keeps your bait off the bottom. You know, it may not float straight up in the water column, but it may, and it keeps it a foot off. Off the bottom, so you get a lot of sticks and stuff down there that it doesn't have a chance to get hung on. If you give if you give your slide and your leader any slack at all, it's where it kind of rolls backwards over that weight, your hook it can go into the bottom and just give them up on them and stuff. Because where I'm fishing, where I catch my biggest fish, there's always going to be some kind of heavy structure, trees or big rocks or you know, up and down holes. Or, there's always going to be something to get hung. And I'll lose a tackle, you're probably not catching fish. Sure. What's what the weight they're using when you're doing that? I use some uh, cannonball weights. I've started using some of those, mainly just bank sinkers. Uh, I really can't tell a huge difference between them. Here's the flow for you. Uh, Demon Dragons, is that right, Demon? Yes, sir. Demon Dragons from uh, Tennessee River Monsters. I, I like them a lot so far. I think that rattle just gives it a little bit of, a little bit of extra pizzazz to it. And that float, the float is the biggest thing I think. It just gets it up off the bottom where you get hung up the float. If you're on the float, you run the risk of jumping over fish. You could. You could. Uh, are the eyes on there for, for your benefit? Yeah. I think the eyes are on there because it used to be a bass lure and they just didn't put hooks on it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's the reason, actually. Repurposed. Well, in your, in your muddy water down there, you can get the Yeah, they, see they're that. not going to see that. Yeah, yeah you get it in clear, like up on the, the tail waters of Bagman Dam uh, from Lake of the Ozarks. They might be able to see that then. But I think the rattle's going to be more important than anything. Because that current's going past that, uh, that bait. It's just sitting there making that noise. I don't know if that sounds like a crawdad or what it sounds like to them. They tend to seem to like it. Remember when you used to I do. I don't do a whole lot of lake fishing. I like the curves. Uh, but yeah, I do use driven sticks and 
uh, it's slinky weights, no snag weights. If, if I'm forced to fish a, fish a lake. <laughs> Are you going to fish the one tonight? Uh, I think we're going to get home tonight. We're in the process of adding on to the house. And I think we're going to get home. we let the dogs there. So I'd like to stay, though. It'd be a good time fishing new water. Not a lot of current. Not much current. That's another thing. <laughs> well, that's, that's 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 how, how quick, how, how windy it is. Yeah. Sure. Well, there might be some. <laughs> yeah, I think we're supposed to have 15 mile hour winds all night long. So, wind driven current. Or to find a brush pile and get that way. Is it? Well, to find one, you're probably going to have fish in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what time of year do you uh, have the best luck? Typically, when the water's a little bit warmer, over 50 degrees, really gets better once it gets over 60 degrees. So, spring and fall, I guess. Let's say the coldest water temperature I've ever caught any fish to, to mount anything is probably about 55, walking baits. Once it gets below 55, the fish just slow down a little bit. They're, they're still in those same areas, but they're just like the summer heat makes them the same. I mean, the summer yeah. heat. Yeah, you can stay and be out there. Now I may fish till 10 in the morning and then 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Maybe not in the, in the hottest part of the day, but yeah, it doesn't don't seem to bother me. How big a weight are you using to get down at, on, the, on Missouri? If I had to have one weight, it'd be a three ounce weight. Three ounce? Yeah. But I go from three ounce, I usually don't go any less than three ounce, just put a two ounce weight on. Especially with the float. A two ounce won't work with the float. Without the float, you can walk a two ounce, but it's pretty tough to feel it sometimes. Especially in, in heavy current. You just get back there so so far so fast. But three to three to five, I can't say I've ever walked in six. Never had the need. But typically when you're walking baits, you'll find where you catch the fish. You might be in a four mile an hour current. When you catch that fish, you'll notice your boat has slowed down a little bit because you hit a little pocket where the water's just a little bit slower. You'll find that's, that's the, the key to stay on that currency. You'll find those little spots that are a little bit slower or a little bit faster. It's always something that's a little bit different where you where you have to catch the fish. Any more questions? It's a whole lot different than being anchored up and having to throw up. Six or an eight or a ten ounce or under. Oh yeah, because you cut your speed in half. Yep, uh, and that's in the same areas where I walk base. If I anchor on those spots, I don't use anything less than an eight ounce weight. You know, I usually go up and use up to the sixteen on the on the outside, so I can kind of spread them out a little bit. Anybody else? If anybody thinks of anything, any questions? Don't don't, be able to, don't hesitate to ask. I'll be here all day. I don't know the right answer, but I'll make something up. You don't know what we get. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.